Welcome back. So with today's session, we will be completing the revision of the multiple choice questions. A total of 70 questions have been attempted from part one to seven. Now let's get started with today's session. Question number 61. Quotations have been sent to clients either late or containing errors. So this is the first problem that is quotations are being sent late or it contains errors. The department concerned has responded that it is understaffed. So that's the second problem that is existing in the department. And a high proportion of current staff has recently joined. So the presence of new employees, that's the third problem. The performance of this department is to be carefully monitored. Which one of the following non-financial performance indicators would not be an appropriate measure to monitor and improve the department's performance. Option A, percentage of quotations found to contain errors when checked. So this performance measure directly highlights the problem that is existing in the department. So it's a good performance measure. Option B, percentage of quotations not issued within the company policy of three working days. This again, highlights the problem that is existing in the department that is sending the quotations late. So that again is a good performance measure. Option C, percentage of department's quota of staff actually employed. Now this performance measure directly highlights the problem of understaffing. So that again is a good performance measure. Now moving on to option D, percentage of budgeted number of quotations actually issued. Now, whenever we are comparing the actuals with the budgets, we are trying to find out whether the particular department has met the budgets or not, whether they are underachievers. But right now, that is not a problem that was existing in the particular department. So in order to improve the department's performance, just by comparing the actuals with the budgets will not help to improve the performance. So this is not a good performance measure. So always we have to look into what are the problems that are existing in the particular department and then suggest suitable performance measures that will improve its performance. So right now the question asks you which is not an appropriate measure. So the right answer is option D. Now moving on to question number 62. Which two of the following key performance indicators would be appropriate to assess the customer perspective within a traditional balanced scorecard. So the four perspectives in a balanced scorecard are the financial perspective, the internal process, the learning and growth, and the customer perspective. So we will analyze each one. Now the customer profitability analysis. Profitability, that is something which is related to the dollar terms. So it comes under the financial perspective. Next one, customer satisfaction rating. Yes, it is coming under customer perspective. Customer retention rates, that also belongs to the customer perspective. Now, customer ordering processing times. Ordering processing times, it is related to the internal business process. So the two performance indicators which comes under the customer perspective are customer satisfaction ratings and customer retention rates. Now, moving on to question number 63, companies A and B are both involved in retailing. Relevant information for the year ended 30th September was as follows. So you're given sales revenue, profit and capital employed. Which of the following statements are true? First one, profit margin of both the companies are the same. What do you mean by profit margin? Profit margin is nothing but profit divided by sales. For company A, the profit is $10,000 and the sales is $50,000. So the profit margin is 20%. And as for company B, the profit is $10,000 and the sales is $200,000. So the profit margin is 0 0.05 or 5%. So they've said that the profit margin is the same. No, it is not the same, which means that option A is false. Now moving to option B, Company B is generating more profit from every dollar of asset employed. Generating more profit from the asset employed. Asset employed means capital employed. That is nothing but return on capital employed given by the formula profit divided by capital employed. As for company A, the profit is $10,000 and the capital employed is $50,000. 
So the return on capital employed is 0.2 or 20%. As for company B, the profit is $10,000 and the capital employed is $50,000. So the return on capital employed is again 0.2 or 20%, which means that both these are same. But in option B, they have said that company B is generating more profit, which means that option B is also false. Now, moving to option C, company B is using its assets more efficiently. Using its assets more efficiently means the sales that are generated from the assets are more. Let's see the difference. So basically, you have to calculate the asset turnover ratio. That is the relationship between assets and sales. So it's given by the formula sales divided by capital employed as for company A, the sales is $50,000 and the capital employed is $50,000. So the asset turnover ratio is one. That is for every dollar of capital employed, you could generate sales of $1. Now the asset turnover ratio of company B is sales is $200,000 and the capital employed is $50,000 which means that the asset turnover ratio is four times. Or for every dollar of capital employed, you could generate four dollar of sales. That is four times, which means that company B is using its assets more efficiently. That's right. So option C is right. Now moving to option D, company B is controlling its cost better than company A. We have to take the expense to sales ratio, that is expenses divided by sales. Only then we can know whether the expenses are getting controlled more efficiently. As for company A, what is the expense? Sales is 50,000 and profit is 10,000. So expense is 50,000 minus 10,000 or $40,000 because that's a difference between sales and profit. And sales, we know it is 50,000, which means that for $50,000 sales, the expense is 40,000 or the percentage is 0.8 or 80%. Now, as for company B, what is the expense? It is 200,000 sales minus profit of 10,000, which means that the expense is $190,000 and sales, we know it is 200,000, which means that the expense to the sales ratio is 0.95 or 95% which means that company B has got a higher percentage of expense that's not controlling their expenses well when compared to company A, which has got expenses of only 80%. Coming to option D, company B is controlling its cost better than company A. That's not right. Now moving to question number 64, the trading account amount in $1,000. The sales is given the opening stock plus purchases minus closing stock. You get the cost of sales. Sales minus cost of sales gives the gross profit. Extracts from the statement of financial position, again, the amount has been given in dollar thousands. So here you've got the current assets, trade receivables, prepayments, and cash. And on this side, you've got the current liabilities, bank overdraft, trade payables, accruals, and declared dividend. Find inventory holding period using average inventory and the current ratio. So let's see the formula for inventory holding period. Inventory holding period is equal to 365 divided by cost of goods sold multiplied by average inventory. We are taking average inventory simply because it is specified in the question. Else we could have very safely taken it as closing inventory. So that's equal to 365 divided by Cox. It is 324.5K and average inventory is equal to the opening stock of 50,000 plus closing stock of 38,000 divided by 2. Solving this, we get inventory holding period as 49 days. Now coming to the current ratio. Current ratio, the formula is current assets divided by current liabilities. So current assets, you've got three current assets here. But here, please do not forget stock in current assets. This is just the extracts from the statement of financial position. The closing stock is given here. So the total of current assets is 38 plus 60 plus 4 plus 6, giving a total amount of 108,000. And as for current liabilities, it is the total of these four, which adds up to 56,000. So the current ratio works out to 1.93. Now moving to question number 65. In this question, you are asked to find out the quick ratio or the acid test ratio. Now, the formula for quick ratio is 
current assets minus stock in the numerator and current liabilities in the denominator. So once you get information about current assets, stock and current liabilities, we will be able to find out the answer. So what we will do is, as and when we read the question, we will jot down the figures from the question. Bindi company has annual sales of $960,000. So sales is $960,000. And a current ratio of 3.2 is to 1. Current ratio, the formula is current assets divided by current liabilities. That is 3.2. All of its sales are for cash. Whenever the sales are for cash, it means that in current assets, the debtors, you can take it as zero because the sales are completely for cash. There is no credit sale taking place and are priced at a markup on cost of 50%. So it is very easy to find out the cost of goods sold because we know that cost plus markup is equal to sales. So if cost is 100, if it is assumed as 100, then the markup that they have given in the question is 50. So the sales will be 150. So if the sales is 150, the cost is 100. So if the sales is $960,000, what is the cost? It is $960,000 divided by 150 multiplied by 100. So whenever the relationship between cost, markup and sales is given and the actual sales is also given in the question, then it is very easy to find out the cost. Now, solving this, we get the cost of goods sold as $640,000. Now, the next sentence, the average cash balance is $40,000 cash. Cash is an item of current assets. And they have said that cash is $40,000. And the inventory holding period is 90 days. We take note of that inventory holding period is 90 days. Now, what is the formula for inventory holding period? It is 360 divided by cost of goods sold into stock. Now, why we have taken 360 instead of 365 is because it is specified in the question. So now we know that the cost of goods sold is $640,000. So the only unknown is the stock. So solving this, we get the value of stock as $160,000. It's 160K. So the stock is $160,000. So what is the total of current assets? $200,000. Since we have got the current assets total, now we can very easily find out the current liabilities. So, substituting current assets in this formula, it's 200,000 divided by current liabilities, which is equal to 3.2, because 3.2 is given in the question. So, the only unknown is current liabilities. So, what is current liabilities? Current liabilities is 200,000 divided by 3.2 or $62,500. So, as far as the quick ratios formula is concerned, we know the current assets, it's 200,000. We know the current liabilities, it's 62,500. We know the stock, it is 160,000. So substituting those figures in the formula, we get 40,000 divided by 62,500 or the quick ratio is 0 0.64. Now moving to question number 66. Now this problem is from the topic transfer pricing. So let's read the question. Oxco has two divisions, A and B. Division A makes a component for air conditioning units, which it can only sell to division B. The first thing that you have to note is which division is selling to which division. So in this particular case, division A is selling to division B. Further in the question, they have said it has got no other outlet for sales. It means division A. 
which means that division A cannot sell this product in the external market. Current information relating to division A is as follows. So we will jot down the important points from the question into the answer. You have to take note of the details regarding the units. That's a production capacity, the marginal cost per unit and the fixed cost. Now, if there was an external selling price, then you should take note of the external selling price also. But thankfully, in this particular question, since division A has no other outlet for sales, there will be no external selling price as far as division A is concerned. Now coming to the current information relating to division A. Marginal cost per unit is $100. So we key in $100 against the marginal cost. The transfer price of the component is $165. So we will write that on top of the zero. Transfer price from A to B is $165. Total production and sales of the component each year is 2,200 units. So that's the production capacity. So we will write that against the production capacity or the units. Specific fixed cost of division A per year is $10,000. So we will take note of the fixed cost and since they have said it is the specific fixed cost, we will take note of that also. Specific fixed cost means fixed costs which are related to division A alone. That is if division A was not there, those fixed costs will not be incurred. Always understand whether it is a specific fixed cost or a general fixed cost. General fixed cost will exist even if that department closes down because it's general to the company. But specific fixed costs will not be incurred if that particular division is closed down. Now, cold company. So this is another company. They have offered to sell the component to division B for $140 per unit. So there is another company called cold company, which is willing to sell this component. Which component that A is transferring to B at what price? At $140 per unit. So we will make note of that also. External purchase price of the same component is $140. So B has an option of either transferring this component from A at $165 or it has an option of buying it from outside at an external purchase price of $140. From which company? From cold company. So this is the situation. If Division B accepts this offer, Division A will be shut down. That is, if Division B purchases from the external market, that is from coal company at $140, then Division A will have to be shut down. If Division B accepts coal company's offer, what will be the impact on profit per year for the group as a whole? So they are asking you to find out what is the difference First case, you have to find out what is the profit that the group will get if the particular component is transferred from division A. And in the second case, you have to find out what is the profit that the group will get if division B decides to purchase from the external market. So there are two situations and then you have to compare the profits and you have to find out what is the impact on the profit because of a change in the decision. So we have taken note of all the information from the questions. So I'm just copying these details into the next slide. Presently, A is transferring to B. And we will find out the profits of A. So we will prepare the profit and loss account of A. And then we will prepare the profit and loss account of B also. Because we need the group profits. Only if we add the profits of both Division A and Division B will we get the group profits or the profits for the company as a whole. The profit and loss account of A contains the sales, that is the external sales and also the transfers from A to B. From that, you have to reduce any variable cost. You have to reduce the fixed cost to arrive at the profit. And as for the profit and loss account of B, we have got the sales, that is the external sales and less any variable cost or the transfer in cost. What do you mean by transfer in cost? When you're transferring the component from A to B, B will have to pay the amount to A. So that's the transfer cost or the transfer price will have to be paid to A by B. So that's the transfer in cost. So the transfer out cost and the transfer in cost will be the same. And further down, you've got the fixed cost attributable to the division B and then you arrive at the profit.
Now, these are the details that we have copied from the question. Now, as far as sales is concerned, Division A does not have any external sales. The only sales that they are making is the transfers from A to B. So the number of units is 2,200 and the transfer price is $165 per unit, which means that the transfers from A to B as a dollar value, it is 2,200 multiplied by 165 or 363,000. Now coming to the variable cost. Variable cost or marginal cost is $100 per unit. And again, the number of units is 2,200. So the total variable cost will be 2,200 multiplied by 100, which is $222,000. And fixed cost, we know it's a specific fixed cost and that's nothing but $10,000. So we arrive at the profit of division A, it's 363,000 minus 220,000 minus 10,000 or the profit amounts to 133,000. Now going to division B. Now here the external sales made by B to the outside market is not known. And just assume that this 2,200 units, that's a component that is transferred from A to B, has been made into a final product and that is being sold at exactly the same price. We'll just take 165 itself as a selling price to the external market. So what is the external sales made by B? It is 2,200 units multiplied by 165 or $363,000. And individual variable cost of division B is not given. So we don't need to consider that variable cost. Now coming to the transfer in cost. Transfer in cost is nothing but the transfer out cost of division A. That's the same thing. So it is a very same thing that will come. 2,200 multiplied by 165, that's equal to 363,000. Now, fixed cost is also not given, which means that the profit is sales of 363,000 minus transfer in cost of 363,000 or the individual profit of B is zero. So what is the group profit? Group profit is a total of 133,000 plus zero or 133,000. Now we will take the second situation. What is the second situation? When B buys from the external market at $140. Now it was mentioned in the question that if B buys from the external market, then division A will have to be shut down. That is in the situation where B buys from the external market, we don't need to consider the profit and loss account of A. So we need to prepare the profit and loss account of B alone. So sales, we will take the exactly same figure. That is, we are selling 2,200 units at a selling price of 165. Whatever you have assumed as the sales figure in the first situation, we will take in the second situation also. So it is the same thing, 2,200 multiplied by 165 or 363,000. Now coming to the transfer in cost. Transfer in cost, it will not come because B is going to buy from the external market at $140, which means that variable cost will come for B. What is the amount? 2,200 units because that's the number of units that we are buying from outside multiplied by 140. So the amount works out to $308,000. So the profit will be $363,000 minus $308,000 or $55,000. So that itself is a group profit because there is no division A in the second situation. So now the group profit in this particular case is $55,000. Now let's compare both the situation. In the first situation, we had a group profit of 133,000. And in the second situation, we had a group profit of 55,000, which means that there is a reduction in profit to the tune of $78,000. $78,000 is nothing but 133 minus 55, you get $78,000. So that's the final answer. So we will get back to the question. They have asked if division B accepts coal company's offer, that is buying from the external market, what will be the impact on profit for the group as a whole? So the right answer, decrease in profit to the tune of $78,000.
for tackling the next problem, you need to know the formula for residual income, which is profit minus notional cost on capital. And what is notional cost? Notional cost is capital employed multiplied by cost of capital percentage. Now, in the upcoming question, the profit is not directly given, but the operating profit ratio is given along with the sales. We can very easily find out the EBIT or the earnings before interest and tax, which is nothing but the profit. This is a broad guideline of the upcoming question. Now, let's read the question. Does company has two divisions, A and B. Each division is currently considering the following separate projects. So, there are two divisions, that is A and B. And the details regarding each project is given here under. So you are asked to find out if residual income is used as the basis for the investment decision, what decision is each division likely to make? Division A, would it choose to invest in the project or would it choose not to invest in the project? Likewise, Division B, would it choose to invest in the project or would it choose not to invest in the project? Now, from the refresher, we know that if residual income of the new project is positive, then the divisional manager or the division will accept the new project. So, all that we have to find out is whether the residual income of the project is positive or negative. If it is positive, it will be accepted. If it is negative, it will be rejected. So let's tackle the question straight away. So I've just copied the details pertaining to the two projects into the new slide. So the formulas, I have copied it on the right side. Residual income is profit minus notional cost on capital. But profit is missing from these details. But the operating profit margin has been given. And operating profit ratio is given by the formula EBIT divided by sales into 100. So that's the starting point. For finding out the EBIT for division A, the operating profit ratio is 30 and the sales of division A is 14.4 million. So solving for EBIT, we get EBIT as 30 into 14.4 million divided by 100 or the EBIT for division A is 4.32 million. Now moving to division B. Division B, the operating profit ratio is 24% and the sales generated is 8.8 .8 million. So here again, when you solve for EBIT, we get the EBIT as 24 million multiplied by 8.8 .8 million divided by 100. We are just isolating EBIT on the right hand side of the equation. So the EBIT works out to 2.112 million. So we have got the profit. That's the first part of the residual income formula. Now coming to the notional cost on capital. Notional cost is given by the formula capital employed multiplied by cost of capital percentage. Both these are given in the information. So all that we have to do is substitute in the formula and get the results. So for division A, the notional cost is capital employed. What is the figure? It's 32.6 million. And the cost of capital percentage is 10%. So the notional cost of division A is 3.26 million. Now coming to division B, the capital employed is 22.2 million and the cost of capital percentage is 10%. So we solve this to get the notional cost as 2.22 million. Now residual income is profit or EBIT minus notional cost on capital. So residual income for division A is 4.32 million, which is the EBIT, minus 3.26 million, which is the notional cost. So residual income works out to 1.06 million. Division B, the residual income is 2.112 million minus 2.22 million, or it is negative 0.108 million. Coming back to the question, since division A's residual income is positive, Division A will accept the investment opportunity and since the residual income of Division B is negative, they will reject or it will not invest in the project.
Now, the upcoming question is about the calculation of the minimum transfer price when there is no spare capacity. So, you could use two formulas. First formula is selling price minus selling expenses per unit or you could also use variable cost excluding selling expenses. Now, VCE means variable cost excluding selling expenses plus the opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is nothing but the lost contribution. Now, we will get to the details of the question. JB Limited is a divisionalized organization comprising a number of divisions, including divisions A and B. Now, the first thing that you have to identify in any transfer pricing problem is which division is selling to which division. So if you see here in the second paragraph, division B would like to obtain 500 units of the product from division A, which means that division A is selling to division B because division B wants the product from division A. Now let's proceed with the other details. Division A makes a single product which it sells on the external market at a price of $12 per unit. Now, whenever Division A is selling to the external market, then the details that you have to compile from the question are, you have to take the production capacity of Division A, that is in number of units. Then you have to take note of the spare capacity of Division A, again, in number of units. Then selling price in the market. What is the selling price that A gets from the external market? Next, variable cost. And then, this is very important, you have to write in bracket, what is the selling expenses included in variable cost? What do you mean by selling expenses? Selling expenses are those expenses which A, division A incurs for selling in the external market. These expenses will not be incurred when division A transfers to division B. So that is why this point is very important. Then you have to take note of the fixed cost also. Now we will read the question and we will fill up these details. Division A makes a single product which it sells on the external market at a price of $12 per unit, which means that the selling price or the price at which A sells in the external market is $12. The variable cost of the product is $8. So we key in $8 against variable cost. And fixed cost is $3 per unit. So we key in that too. Market demand for the product considerably exceeds Division A's maximum production capacity of 10,000 units per month which means that the maximum production capacity of division A is 10,000 units. So against maximum production capacity, we key in 10,000 units. And what have they said? Market demand for the product considerably exceeds division A's maximum production capacity, which means that spare capacity is zero. That is, there are no goods which are left unsold by A, which means that a will have to sacrifice certain external sales to make a transfer to division B. That is the meaning of spare capacity is equal to zero. Division B would like to obtain 500 units of the product from division A. So the quantity to be transferred are 500 units. If division A does transfer some of its product internally rather than sell externally, then the savings in packaging cost would be $1.5. This is the selling expenses. That is, A is incurring packaging cost for selling in the external market, but it will save that when it transfers the same product to Division B. So we key in 1.5 there. What transfer price per unit should Division A quote in order to maximize the group profit? So Division A is the selling division which means that what they are asking is the minimum transfer price. So the formula for minimum transfer price is it's either selling price minus selling expenses per unit or it's variable cost excluding selling expenses plus the opportunity cost. Now we will work out the solution using both these formulas. So regarding the first formula, what is the selling price? Selling price is $12. So we write selling price $12. And what is the selling expenses? Selling expenses is 1.5. So what is the minimum transfer price? 
It's 12 minus 1.5 or dollar 10.5 per unit. So we have to get the very same answer if we adopt the second formula as well. Now, what is variable cost excluding selling expenses? The total variable cost is 8. That is including selling expenses of 1.5, which means that variable cost excluding selling expenses is 8 minus 1.5 or $6.5 dollar per unit. Now coming to the opportunity cost. What is the opportunity cost? Opportunity cost is nothing but the lost contribution. So we have to work out contribution. Contribution is selling price minus variable cost. So selling price is 12, variable cost is 8. So 12 minus 8, the opportunity cost or the lost contribution is $4. So we get the minimum transfer price as 6.5 plus 4 or $10.5 per unit. So even if we adopt this formula or we adopt this formula, we get the very same answer. Now moving on to the next question. Parent company has two divisions A and B. Division A has limited skilled labor and is operating at full capacity. Making product Y. It has been asked to supply a different product x to division b from this sentence we got two information a is the selling division and b is the buying division and b wants a different product x to be produced by a we already know that a is operating at full capacity and that too making a product y so what is being said is a should sacrifice the production of product y because it's operating at full capacity and make product X for division B. Division B currently sources this product externally for $700 per unit. So right now, this product is being procured. Which product? Product X is being procured by B from the external market at a purchase price of $700. But please note that in the question, they have asked, using an opportunity cost approach to transfer pricing, what is the minimum transfer price? This external purchase price is required for the calculation of maximum transfer price of the buying division. It is not required for the calculation of the minimum transfer price. So we don't need this information in this particular question. So we will just delete that. The same grade of materials and labor is used in both products. That is for both X and Y. It is the same grade of materials and labor which is being used. And we know that Division A has limited skilled labor. Which means that if we have to produce product X, we will have to sacrifice the production of product Y. So they have given a whole lot of detail. Selling price given, variable cost. There are two items, direct material and direct labor cost. And they've also given the fixed overheads. Now, we've got two formulas for calculating the minimum transfer price. But in this particular question, we cannot use this formula. Why? Because right now, division A is producing product Y, which has got a different selling price. And then the product that is being transferred to division B is product X which has got a different cost structure. We can adopt either of the two formulas only when the same product is getting transferred from division A to division B. We are forced to use this formula. We have to use variable cost excluding selling expenses plus opportunity cost because both these will not give the same results. So I'm going to delete the first formula. So now coming to this one formula. So you've got variable cost excluding selling expenses. And then we have got the opportunity cost. Variable cost excluding selling expenses is relating to product X. That is a product that is getting transferred. And the opportunity cost is actually the lost contribution of product Y, which we are suffering because of manufacturing product X. This is the logic. Now, in order to calculate the opportunity cost or the lost contribution, we have to see whether it is the same amount of time that is taken by product X and product Y because we have got limited skilled labor. So focus your attention in this line, direct labor. Right now, product Y, the labor cost is $1.80 and hourly rate is 
So how many hours are being taken for product Y? It is 80 divided by 20 or 4 hours. Now coming to product X. Product X, the labor cost is 120 and the rate per hour is $1.20. Which means that the hours taken is 120 divided by 20 or 6 hours. So from this it is clear that for every unit of Y, 4 hours are being taken. And for every unit of X, 6 hours is being taken. So, to manufacture 1 unit of X, which takes 6 hours, how many units of Y's production are we sacrificing? So, this is what we are trying to find out. So in 4 hours, 1 unit of Y. So, in 6 hours, how many units of Y? Now, to solve for the question mark, just cross multiply. So, the question mark or the number of units of Y which are produced in 6 hours is 6 by 4 units of Y. Simplifying, it is 1.5 units of Y, which means that for every unit of X produced, which takes 6 hours, we are sacrificing the production of 1.5 units of Y. Now we will calculate the opportunity cost or the lost contribution. So the contribution of one unit of Y we know contribution is selling price minus variable cost. So the contribution of one unit of Y is equal to 600 minus 200 minus 80. Or it is equal to $320. But that was the contribution of one unit of Y. We need the loss contribution of 1.5 units of Y. So for 1.5 units of Y, what is the loss contribution? It is 320 multiplied by 1.5 or it is $480. So that is the opportunity cost or that is the lost contribution when we are producing one unit of X. 480 will come here. That's the opportunity cost. And what about the variable cost excluding selling expenses? Selling expenses, they have not mentioned anything in the question. So we can just take it as nil. So the variable cost for producing one unit of X is 150 plus 120 or $270. So the minimum transfer price is equal to 270 plus 480 or $750. So the right answer is option B. profit organization, I want you to analyze what will come on the input side and what will come on the output side. Now, input side is nothing but the resources which are used by any organization. It could either be human resources or the physical assets. Say if it is a school, the human resources will be the teachers and the physical assets will be the furniture, the buses, etc. And on the output side, you've got the beneficiary and the objective. What do you mean by beneficiary? Beneficiary is the person who receives the benefit. So it will be the students. And what is the objective of any school? To achieve a good pass percentage and give quality education. So for any not-for-profit organization, if you analyze it as input and output, it will be very easy for you to apply the value for money concepts. Now, what do you mean by value for money concepts? Now, we all know that any not-for-profit organizations cannot be evaluated based on the profits that they achieve because that's just not their objective. So, the value for money is a measure to evaluate the performance of the organization. So, what is the first E coming under value for money? It is economy. We have to check whether the resources are cheap and of the right quality. Whenever you say resources are cheap, and it should be the right quality, we are focusing on the input side. So economy always focuses on the input side and we are not bothered about the output side. Now coming to efficiency. In efficiency, we are trying to find out whether maximum output is being achieved from the resources used or inputs are being linked to outputs. As an example, you could say the teacher-student ratio. You're linking the input to the output. So that's a measure of efficiency. And finally, effectiveness. Effectiveness, we have to ensure whether the objectives of the organization are met. 
that is solely an output measure. If the measure highlights the pass percentage of the students, then we are trying to find out whether the objectives are met. So that is a measure of effectiveness. So with this idea in mind, we will tackle the next question. Deaf company provides accounting services to the government. So it is an accounting services company. So we will analyze it as input and output. Now the government is the beneficiary because the services is rendered to the government. On an average, each staff member works six chargeable hours per day, with the rest of their working day being spent on non-chargeable administrative work. One of the company's main objective is to produce a high level of quality and customer satisfaction. So we immediately understood what is the objective of the organization. Deaf company has set its targets for the next year as follows. Cutting departmental expenditure by 5%. Now think for yourself. Departmental expenditure. Departmental expenditure is the expenses incurred either for the humans, that is the staff salary, etc. Or the expenditure incurred for the assets, either for the maintenance or for purchase of new assets. If we were to cut departmental expenditure by 5%, then we are focusing solely on the input side or we are trying to find out a cheaper resource without compromising on the quality. So clearly, it's a measure of economy. Now, the second target, increasing the number of chargeable hours handled by advisors to 6.2 per day. Right now, it is 6 chargeable hours and they are going to increase it to 6.2 per day. Now, advisors are the human resources. And on the input side, you have the total hours available for the advisors. And on the output side, you have the chargeable hours or the hours where the advisors work for the beneficiary or the government. Say the total working hours in a day is 8 hours. So instead of charging 6 out of 8 hours, they are planning to increase it to 6.2 hours out of 8 hours. Which means that you are trying to link the chargeable hours to the total hours or we are linking an input to an output, which means that it is a sign of efficiency. Now, the third target, obtaining a score of 4.7 or above on customer satisfaction surveys. Now, we already saw that customer satisfaction is an objective and meeting the objective is definitely a measure of effectiveness. Oh, 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 oh,